Today's video is brought to you by Athletic Greens and its awesome daily health and nutritional supplement, AG1. AG1 is a comprehensive all-in-one greens powder engineered to fill the nutritional gaps in your diet and support your body's nutritional needs across four pillars of health, gut health, immune support, energy, and recovery. It's packed with 75 vitamins and minerals and whole food sourced ingredients, combining the perfect amount of micronutrients, absorption, and taste to jumpstart your daily routine. You'd be hard pressed to find a more comprehensive powder or supplement on the market. Now, as you guys know, I'm not exactly a fitness and lifestyle YouTuber, but I do like to eat right and take care of myself. And AG1 is the comprehensive nutritional supplement that I know is going to account for any holes that I might have in my diet. One scoop uh, goes in here with some water in the morning. I typically have it with my coffee and uh, it tastes pretty good as well. But most importantly, 75 vitamins and minerals. Plus, it's gluten-free, dairy-free, paleo, vegan, keto, low allergen, and low calorie. There's less than one gram of sugar per serving, but it does taste surprisingly sweet. One of the things I personally like about it is, I, like I said, I drink it with my coffee. I feel it sustains that energy. AG1 is the perfect dietary support regimen. So if this sounds like the supplement you've been looking for, you can get up your own immunity bundle, which also gives you a year of vitamin D, plus five additional travel packs that look something like this for free with your first purchase at athleticgreens.com forward slash brain food. Again, that's a year's supply of vitamin D plus five free travel packs at athleticgreens.com forward slash brain food, or just click the link in the description below. And now today's video. When we talk about famous heists, maybe our minds go to the Antwerp diamond robbery of 2003 or the brazen Lufthansa heist at JFK in 1978. We may even remember the Isabel Stewart Gardner Museum theft of 1990. Not only did these heists garner headline news, but some of them were adapted into movies or subplots. Think Goodfellas, which was partly based on the Lufthansa heist. Others may not have made headlines or had movies made based on them, but once you hear the details, you might wonder, how did the screenwriters sleep on those stories? The Blue Diamond Affair is one of those. Diplomatic disasters, police corruption, fraud, kidnapping, assassinations, and murder all followed in its wake, with the whole thing still being unresolved to this day. Here, now, today, the story of the Blue Diamond Affair. So, the entire affair started simple enough. Thai janitor and gardener Kriankai Techemong worked in the palace home of a Saudi prince, Faisal bin Fahd. At the time, Kriang Krai was struggling with gambling debts that continued to grow as he made more and more bets in the employee residence for palace workers. In need of a way out, Kriang Krai decided to get morally flexible about resolving his problems. In 1989, Prince Faisal was to go on a three-month holiday with his family. With a deep knowledge of the palace and relatively free access due to his job, Kriang Krai knew that Prince Faisal stored his wealth of jewels in three of four safes that were usually kept unlocked. And so it was that after the prince went on holiday, Kriang Krai put his plan into motion. A simple plan being generally the best, he simply waited until the other staff were off the premises and snuck into the prince's bedroom. Next, he took out a couple of hundred pounds worth of jewelry and duct taped many of the items to his body, as well as stuffed as much as he could fit into a vacuum cleaner's bag, which he would then have shipped to Thailand. After shipping the jewels, he flew to Thailand before the prince's vacation ended. Upon arrival, he bribed the customs officials, searching the incoming Container not to look too closely at his bag. Crayon Cry explained to them that he was bringing home pornography and didn't want to confiscate it. His plan worked and he took the loot home to the northern Thai province of Lampang. So, what did Kriang Krai steal? Well, that would be about $20 million worth of jewelry. This included watches, necklaces, rubies, and most mysteriously, a large 50 carat supposedly cursed blue diamond. On this one, we don't actually have a picture of the diamond in question, with only eyewitnesses and official accounts of its existence coming from Saudi officials and Kriang Krai himself. Of course, stealing incredibly valuable jewelry is one thing, finding someone to buy it is another, and upon arriving in Lampang, Kriang Krai had a hard time fencing the stolen items. However, ultimately, he found a jeweler, Santhi, Sith, and Nak, and willing to purchase them for an undisclosed amount. Not long after, in January of 1990, the Saudis managed to trace the theft to Kriang Krai, and Thai police lieutenant, general and Elvis Presley enthusiast, something that will become significant later on, Chalor Curtis led a team that arrested Kriang Krai and seized the stolen jewels from Santhi, the jeweler. For his part, Kriang Krai did not put up a fight and admitted to his deeds, reducing what could have been a seven-year jail sentence to just three. As for Lieutenant General Chalor, he announced the seizure and led a delegation to Saudi Arabia to return the jewels. 
jewels. But curiously, not before the seized jewels were held at a Bangkok hotel for two days before being officially transferred to a police station for no apparent reason at the time. Thai-Saudi relations up to this point were actually pretty good. Both nations were monarchies and pursued anti-communist repressions during the Cold War. The Thai economy relied heavily on remittances, and there were around 200,000 Thai workers in Saudi Arabia backed by a robust industry in Thailand dedicated to recruiting laborers to work there. Additionally, the tourism sector flourished as Thailand was a popular destination for Saudis and others in the Middle East. Keeping these relations good was of utmost importance to the Thai government and so Chalor's delegation had a lot riding on it. And here's where the story takes a sudden turn. Upon investigation, the Saudis spotted that the jewels were fake, replaced with paste copies. Even then, only 80% of the missing jewels were returned, with the most important of them still missing, the cursed 50 carat blue diamonds. Upon this discovery, Chalor and the Thai police were immediately under suspicion by the Saudis. It didn't help that the wives of police and government officials were rumored by the Thai press to be wearing jewelry suspiciously similar to the stolen items to important events. Attempting to resolve the mystery, the Saudis ordered its diplomats serving in Thailand to investigate, as well as dispatching a businessman named Muhammad Awar Ali with ties to the Saudi royal family to carry out his own investigation. Naturally, this set off a string of bloody murders. So what happened? In February of the same year, the Saudi consul investigating the case, Abdullah al-Bersri, was shot in his apartment, and around 10 minutes later, diplomats Fahad al-Bali and Ahmed al-Saif were shot in their car en route to the Saudi embassy. Later that same month, al-Rawali was kidnapped and was never seen again. To this day, nobody has been found, but he is presumed dead. These murders made a tense situation between the two countries worse, and the Saudis downgraded their diplomatic relations as a result. This in turn put pressure on the Thai government because downgrading relations meant putting on hold the recruitment and immigration process for Thai workers to Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia further banned its citizens from hiring Thai workers, and the number of Thai migrant workers in Saudi Arabia dropped from around 200,000 to 10,000. Naturally, the pressure was on to resolve the case, and so it was that Saudi Arabia dispatched the colorful Mohammed Said Koja. Not pulling any punches, Koja immediately accused the police of corruption, theft of the jewels, and murder of the diplomats. He also had a habit of conducting interviews about all of this with his gun placed on the desk. As to those murders, American diplomatic reports unearthed by WikiLeaks claimed that it was all a Hezbollah plot against the Saudis. Much later, the Thai Department of Special Investigations would try and pin at least one of the murders on an Arab by the name of Abu Ali, a generic pseudonym while also claiming the Blue Diamonds never actually existed at all. However, through the use of a private investigator, Koja uncovered what he believed to be the events leading up to Al Ruari's murder. He was abducted by police and taken to a hotel for interrogations to reveal what he had turned up so far. Whatever the results of the interrogation were, he was then taken to a farm to be executed, and his body was supposedly burned. Two years after Al Rawali's disappearance, Police Lieutenant Colonel Somgird Boon Thanom was arrested and charged with his murder. The charges against Somgird, however, were eventually dropped, but his name is going to come up again. Hoping to smooth things over, in June of 1991, Thai officials reopened the case and later arrested four people on charges of receiving stolen goods and charged an investigating officer with embezzlement. One of those arrested was Santhi the jeweler. Officials accused him of making the fakes that were delivered to Saudi Arabia by Lieutenant General Chalor. Purportedly, Santhi either sold the goods or, as believed by the Saudis, colluded with the police to sell or hide them. As a key witness in the case, naturally, in July of 1994, he was kidnapped by police and his wife and son went missing only to be found in a car accident in Bangkok. The bodies showed signs of blunt force trauma not consistent with the car accident and it appeared that the accident was staged. Despite these assessments, the official forensics report concluded that it was indeed an accident and there was absolutely no foul play. However, as for Koja, he made waves in the news denying the report and accusing the forensic commander of covering up the original crime. Later, autopsies confirmed this showing the individuals did not die in a car accident. Apparently insanely good at their job, the police then concluded the individuals were likely murdered and the murder was staged to look like a car accident after all. What? Just to muddy the waters further, they would later try to walk back that statement by claiming the blunt force trauma was caused by the truck that struck the car, and it was indeed 
just a tragic accident. This didn't really work, surprisingly, and Lieutenant General Chalor was arrested and charged with murdering Santhi's family. During Chalor's trial, it was concluded that four men carried out the murders on behalf of the police. Supposedly, they kidnapped the family to extort millions out of Santhi, but whatever reason, his family was murdered instead. Chalor was sentenced to death, we'll come back to him in just a bit, and neither he nor Santhi would divulge any information about the rest of the missing jewels. Kojab, the Saudi investigator, claimed that the rest of the jewels were held by a a small number of high-ranking Thai officials and are still in the country. Chalor, on the other hand, maintained his innocence of both the theft and the murders. But always not lost for the missing items, as rumors of a curse seem to weigh heavily on some of the recipients of the jewelry. As throughout 1994, some items from the hall were periodically dropped off to the police with notes citing their return owing to the item's curse. Also in 1994, the aforementioned Lieutenant Colonel Son Kid, who was previously charged with Al Ruali's disappearance, would get a promotion to Intelligence Chief of the Bangkok Police Department. Fast forward to 2009, 20 years after the theft and murders, and 10 years after the death of Prince Faisal in 1999, the statute of limitations was about to pass on the whole thing. Before that happened, Saudi Arabia increased pressure on the Thai government to solve the murders and the theft once and for all. It was at this point that supposedly new evidence pointed back to now Lieutenant General Somgit. In the interim of all this, repeated attempts were made to charge him with Al Rawali's murder, but these were thwarted by public prosecutors until it was pushed hard enough by the Department of Special Investigations. And so it was that the Lieutenant General was finally staring down murder charges. Apparently still with friends in high places while awaiting trial, a baffling turn of events occurred. Lieutenant General Somgid was promoted once again, this time to Assistant National Police Chief. Putting aside the timing of the promotion, his new promotion potentially gave Somgid control over his own case. This angered the Saudis as they knew Thailand had laws prohibiting the promotion of an officer charged with committing a criminal act. Thai officials countered by citing laws that seemed to be grandfathered in, allowing for Somgid's promotion. Further, the National Police Chief tried to argue that Somkid's promotion was actually a demotion. The Saudis, however, didn't buy it, and seeing the Saudis close to pulling relations altogether, Somkid decided to reject his promotion, only to accept a slightly lesser one to Inspector General a week later. If you think this probably didn't go over well, and things were all looking okay for Somkid, you'll not be entirely shocked to learn that in March of 2014, Somkid and the other police officers accused at the time were all acquitted, and Saudi-Thai relations suffered greatly as a result. In the end, only two people actually saw prison time over the ordeal. Kriang Krai Takamon for the theft and Lieutenant General Chalor Kurdzes for the kidnapping of Santhi the jeweler and the murder of his wife and son. As for Kriang Krai, he was released early due to good behavior. He promptly changed his name to avoid attention, but according to him, people still track him down and press him for information about the stolen jewelry from time to time. He was also reportedly plagued with guilt over his actions and thus in 2016 became a monk, inviting the media to his ordination. However, he didn't last long as a monk and left the monastery to work odd jobs to support his family. As for Chalor, we can't even make this stuff up while in jail. Ever the Elvis enthusiast, he became an Elvis impersonator and recorded a cover of Jailhouse Rock. Beyond this, Chalor maintained his innocence throughout his stay in jail and upon release. Even though he initially received the death penalty, he is very much alive and out of jail presently. Much like Kriankrai, he also became a monk and was even at Kriankrai's ordination. As for the present state of things, in January 2022, relations between the two governments seem to be normalizing again as the Thai Prime Minister Prayuth Chan Olcha went to Saudi Arabia for a two-day visit to meet with the Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. The Saudis still maintain the case has not been properly handled, and for now the Blue Diamond remains missing and the murders of the Saudi diplomats are still unsolved. And so it is that the Blue Diamond affair may not be over yet.